God's peace to you on this Thursday of Holy Week. I have been preaching on the passion of uh, Christ as Matthew records it this week. So if you tuned in expecting a Monday Thursday sermon, you need to go back and listen to Tuesday's sermon. I'm actually going to be covering uh, Jesus before Pilate uh, as he's been arrested. So beginning with Matthew 27 verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge. So the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. And so after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife said to him word, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. And the governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? And all of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning. He took some water and he washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head, and they put a reed in his right hand, and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And after mocking him, they stripped him of his robe and put his own clothes on him, and they led him away to crucify him. Pontius Pilate was the fifth governor of uh, Judea. History really records very little about him other than what I just read to you. We know he was a thuggish ruler. He was uh, a provocateur religiously. He used to trample on uh, Jewish religious sensibilities quite a bit. Didn't seem to bother him. Uh, and a few years after the trial of Jesus, we know that he is fired by the emperor so to speak, because he put down a rebellion uh, among the Samaritans and he did it so violently that the emperor decided he could no longer be governor. You have to ask yourself, how violent is a man when Rome says, hey, you went too far on that one? Ironically, uh, if he hadn't been the one to sentence Jesus to die on a cross, he'd probably be just a footnote in our history books. I say ironically because throughout this entire passage, 
Pilate just wants this trial to go away. He's remembered for the one decision that he made as a governor that he tried with every fiber in his being to avoid making. Every step that Pilate takes, every decision to exercise his authority uh, as governor just ends up diminishing him. This is a portrait of a man diminishing in power and authority as he judges a righteous and innocent man, Jesus. And he knows it. You notice that he knew it was out of jealousy that Jesus was handed over to him. He knew that his accusers were using him and were using the law uh, not to bring about justice or a right judgment, but to execute a rival out of envy. But rather than declare Jesus innocent, something he has full authority to do, uh, he, he tries to, he abdicates his authority and tries to get the crowd to do his work for him. He takes a notorious criminal, Jesus Barabbas, on one side uh, and, the, and Jesus Messiah on the other, and he says, you decide. It's really too clever by half. He tries to demonstrate the innocence of Jesus by putting him up against an obvious criminal. Here is good and here is evil before you. Now you tell me, who will you do you wish to set free? And to drive home the point, both men have the same name, Jesus. The one he calls Jesus Messiah, furthermore, has been preaching for three years in the name of his father. And he's always referred to God as his father, Barabbas literally translates out to son of the father. In all his foolish cuteness here, Pilate is asking them to choose between Jesus, son of the father, and Jesus, Messiah. And in doing so, he shows us, really, that he's far from innocent, as he's later going to claim. Pilate is as guilty as sin and corrupt he knows he's got an innocent man here, but he's not going to exercise the authority that he's been given to declare him innocent. And he's so feckless and he's so powerless that he ends up tossing governance to the rule of the mob. He refuses to govern and as such becomes a puppet of the people. His wife sends him word, have nothing to do with this righteous man I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. In first century Palestine, women are seen as the wisdom of the house, uh, of the family. Women guide men with wise counsel. It's always done behind doors uh, so that their husband's honor ratings are not seen to be publicly challenged by them. But it's actually the women who culturally remind men how to act honorably, how to be honorable. Uh, it's, it's the women who end up raising the boys and teaching them really how to be men, how to be honorable men through their, what is seen as their wise counsel. I have no idea whether the governor who was governing in that area lived with that cultural assumption himself. Uh, but he does seem to somewhat attempt to follow her wise advice. He can honor her request if he isn't the one to condemn Jesus, but the crowd does it instead. Ironically, the more he tries to honor his wife's request, the deeper he mires himself into the problem. His inaction ends up forcing his hand and his attempt to avoid responsibility just ends up ensnaring him. He is governor of this region. He speaks for the emperor and with the emperor's full authority, and yet Pilate ends up being powerless, weak, and can't control the crowd. And he looks out over them, and he ends up saying to them, Really? 
Really? You see that one of these men is clearly a criminal and the other is clearly innocent and you choose the evil one? And here's the problem. And it's been the problem since the Garden of Eden. Man calls evil good and good evil. Man uses power to achieve his own sinful ends instead of God's righteous ends. And then the governor, the one with full power and authority to do the right thing, to declare Jesus Messiah innocent, instead concludes, I can do nothing. He concludes that he is powerless. And he takes water and he washes his hands. And instead of declaring Jesus innocent, he says, I'm innocent. This man's blood is not on my hands. But it is. He says with his lips to the crowd, see to it yourselves. But the reality is that he assembled the cohort. We're talking about 500 to 600 soldiers. To witness Jesus being stripped and crowned with thorns and beaten and robed in royal scarlet. And no one, not even Jesus of Nazareth, gets nailed to a cross without Pilate signing the orders. Ironically, in trying to avoid all judgment and responsibility for crucifying Jesus, Pilate not only ends up crucifying him, but he's remembered every week in our church services when we Christians say the creed and, and recite the line, crucified under Pontius Pilate. Few Christians can name who was emperor of Rome when Christ was crucified. But if you walk up to any child who has spent any time at all in church and you say, who was Jesus crucified under? They will come back with the name of the one who declared himself innocent, Pontius Pilate. There isn't enough water in the Sea of Galilee for Pilate to scrub his hands clean. His declaration that this man's blood is not on me is powerless before the judgment of history. And what about that blood? The crowd shouting for his crucifixion says, his blood be on us and on our children. More tragically ironic words were never spoken. Honestly, I usually wince when we get to this passage because it has a very dark history in uh, the Christian church. It's been used in really tragic and evil ways to persecute Jews with this idea that, oh, see, they, they said his blood is on our heads. But look at the passage. Take it out of racial contexts, which is what we do, and look at the passage and everyone who is denying Jesus and as they seek to diminish him and make him go away and end the problem, they really are coronating him and elevating him and further accomplishing God's purpose. They take him to the cross and uh, they make his words ironically true. Christ's blood is upon them and upon their children. Christ's blood covers Pilate, even when he tries to wash his hands of it. Christ's blood covers the crowds who shout crucify him. He bleeds for the soldiers who beat him and stripped him and mocked him and nailed him to the cross. In Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 8, St. Paul says, But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God proves his love in that while we were in the middle of our sins, while we were shouting crucify him, while we were saying put his blood on our head, that's precisely when Christ died for us. While we were in the middle of our sinning, we got caught in the act by the love of God. 
that love was silent in the face of our accusations. He said nothing to the false accusers, to the powerless governors, to bloodthirsty crowds. He said nothing because his answer was to bleed, to show us that our sinful brokenness leads us to call crucifixion a good end to a troublesome man. Our sinfulness calls us, causes us to call good evil and evil good. And the only way to prove that God loves us was to bleed and to give us what we demanded, that his blood be on our heads and on our children. Amen.